السلام عليكم احنا هنشرح النهارده الروتيتور كف الاناتومي والبايو ميكانكس والالجوريزم كول ماتش الروتيتور كف ار وان اوف ذا موست كومن كوزز اوف شولدر بين اند ديسابيلتي ان اذر بيشنتس وي شال نو وات از ذا سب اكروميال سبيس ات از ذا اريا باوندد بتوين ذا هيومرال هيد بلو and the uh, uh, coracoacromial arch and the undersurface of the acromion and the AC joint above. The coracoacromial ligament is a condensation of the clavi pectoral fascia. Uh, it acts as a knife-like uh, mechanism impinging on the rotator cuff during forward flexion of the humeral head. Also, we had to know what is the acromiohumeral interval, which is the distance between the undersurface of the acromion and the um, humeral head. This area uh, is occupied by two millimeters of articular cartilage of the humeral head together with the joint capsule which is about two millimeters in addition and the supraspinatus tendon about four millimeter as well as the subacromial bursa. These are the contents of the subacromial uh, space namely the bursa, the rotator cuff and the biceps tendon. The impingement syndrome is a painful condition in which the soft tissues of the subacromial space, the bursa, the rotator cuff, and the biceps tendon became entrapped between the humeral head and the coracoacromial arch. This is especially common with uh, abduction together with an internal rotation. And so this will lead to the three basic conditions of uh, the rotator cuff, namely the subacromial impingement, the rotator cuff tears and the calcific tendonitis. When the uh, rotator cuff became entrapped uh, uh, under uh, the coracoacromial arch, an inflammation will occur in the uh, tendon, which can progress later on to a rotator cuff tear. These are the components of the rotator cuff, as we can see uh, in this uh, picture. The supraspinatus mainly superiorly, the infraspinatus anterior minor posteriorly, and subscapularis mainly anteriorly. Also, it is apparent here the supraspinatus subscapularis with an anterior view of the shoulder. If we start to speak about the subscapularis, it arises from the sub subscapular fossa of the scapula to be inserted on the lesser tuberosity of the humerus, and it is an internal rotator of the arm. The supraspinatus arises from the supraspinatus fossa of the scapula to be inserted on the superior facet of the greater tuberosity of the humerus and it is an abductor of the arm. The infraspinatus arises from the infraspinous fossa of the scapula to be inserted in the middle facet on the greater tuberosity of the humerus and it is an external rotator of the arm. Finally, the teres minor arises from the superior part of the lateral border of the scapula to be inserted on the inferior facet of the greater tuberosity of the humerus and it is an external rotator of the arm. We should be all aware about the footprint concept of the rotator cuff, uh, which states that the uh, tendons are not inserted at a point, but on a surface area rather than, which was discussed at first by Kurtz et al. in the Arthroscopy Journal in, uh, 20, uh, in 2001. The footprint insertion for the subscapularis is an area about 40 by 20 millimeters on the lesser tuberosity, the supraspinatus 23 by 16 millimeters, the infraspinatus 29 by 19, and finally the teres minor 29 by 21. This is the work which had been uh, suggested by Sujaya et al, explaining the uh, different insertion of the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus on the facets of the greater tuberosity. Another point in the anatomy is the rotator cuff cable. What is the rotator cuff cable? It is an organized parallel line uh, bundle of connective tissue thickening, which is forming a curved capsular structure on the superior lateral aspect of the glenohumeral capsule. It starts anteriorly at the anterior part of the superior facet of the greater tuberosity and extends posteriorly between the insertion areas of the infraspinatus and the teres minor. In addition to that, there is the rotator cuff crescent, which is the distal attachment of the blended supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendons onto the head of the humerus. This area is avascular and it is the most common site for rotator cuff tears. 
the suspension bridge analog, which is uh, the transmission uh, of uh, the loads through the thick rotator cuff cable, which is providing a stress shielding effect on the thinner tissue, which is the rotator cuff crescent. This occurs by distributing the forces across the span of the humeral head, the same as the suspension bridge, which is transmitting the loads towards the two towers through the suspension bridge concept. And so if the suspension bridge concept is disrupted as in rotator cuff tears, this will lead to the uh, loss of the suspension mechanism and the transmission to the two pillars anteriorly and posteriorly. What is the function or the action of the rotator cuff? They form the mechanical couple together with the deltoid, allowing the abduction and elevation of the arm. Also, they prevent the upward pull of the deltoid on the humeral head. They keep the humeral head centered in the glenoid, and they rotate the humeral head, which is important during elevation. As we can see here in this diagram, the deltoid is having an upward pull on the humeral head. The supraspinatus is getting the humeral head to be centered on uh, the glenoid, while the subscapularis infraspinatus and teres minor are acting in the opposite direction to the deltoid to uh, form a force couple, preventing uh, the displacement of the humeral head upwards. So what is the force couple concept? There are two force couples on the uh, glenohumeral uh, joint. The first one is the horizontal couple, and the second one is the vertical. This is the line of pull of the deltoid, and this is the line of pull of the rotator cuff. The vertical couple is the couple acting between the deltoid versus the infraspinatus, the subscapularis, the latissimus dorsi, the teres minor, and teres major, preventing the upward pull of the deltoid on the humeral head, and this helps to keep the humeral head centered on the glenoid and pulling the humeral head downwards, opposing the action of the deltoid while the horizontal couple is maintained in the horizontal plane between the subscapularis anteriorly and the infraspinatus posteriorly, the infraspinatus pulling the humeral head medially and posteriorly, while the subscapularis pulling the humeral head medially and anteriorly. If we start to speak about the classification of the rotator cuff tears, it could be classified according to the duration, whether acute or chronic, according to the degree of the tear, whether partial or full thickness tears, according to the etiology, whether traumatic or degenerative, and based upon the size of the tear. The partial tears, they involve about 50% of the tendon thickness, and they are classified as an intrasubstance, a bursal sided or an articular sided, versus the full thickness, which is classified as a small tear, about one centimeter, from one to three centimeter, a medium tear, more than or three to five centimeters, a large tear, and more than five centimeters, this is a massive tear. As we can see here in the diagrams, the partial uh, articular and partial bursal surface. This more clear, this is the articular surface, grade one, less than 25% of the thickness of the tendon, and type two, or grade two, uh, about 50% of the thickness, and grade three, more than 50% of the thickness, as well as also on the bursal side, grade one and grade two and grade three. This is the progression of the tears at first tendinosis, then it extends into a partial thickness tear and then a full thickness tear. Hapermeyer had uh, a topographic classification uh, dividing the rotator cuff into an ant anterior zone by subscapularis, superior zone by the supraspinatus, and a posterior zone by the uh, infraspinatus anterior minor. This is Elman and Gartzman classification according to the shape of the tear. It could be crescent, could be a reverse L, L-shaped, trapezoidal or massive tear. And this is an arthroscopic view of the different types of rotator cuff tears. Also, as we had said that the tear could be a small one, less than one centimeter retraction, or a moderate tear between one to three, or a large tear between three to five centimeters, or a massive tear more than five centimeters. This is the natural history of rotator cuff tear. At first, the rotator cuff tear occurs, and so the rotator cuff cannot counteract the upward pull of the deltoid on the humeral head, and so the uh, humeral head cannot be held against the glenoid with diminution in the uh, um, acromiohumeral distance, 
This leads to the abutment of the humeral head under the surface of the acromion, leading to a stabilization of the acromion and finally a rotator cuff arthropathy. These are the effects of rotator cuff deficiency, loss of the centering forces, superior humeral head migration, destruction of the articular cartilage, superior glenoid erosion, leakage of the synovial fluid, osteoporosis, humeral head destruction, articulation with the undersurface of the acromion, uh, what is known as uh, acetabulization, coraco acromion ligament erosion, and destruction of the acromioclavicular Subscapularis tears are hidden tears, usually start on the articular side of the lesser tuberosity. The diagnosis is mainly confirmed by the arthroscopy, usually accompanied by biceps long head injuries, which is a complete tear with complete fatty degeneration more than grateful. This is the MRI showing uh, the partial bursal surface tears, and this is an example of a full thickness rotator cuff tear. And this is a uh, gotelier, the fatty degeneration of the rotator cuff. As we can see on the right side, there is a complete degeneration of the rotator cuff. And this one for the subscapular tendon tears. The goals of rotator cuff repair is to minimize the gap formation, to have a high initial fixation strength, to maintain a mechanical st uh, stability, and to optimize the biology of the tendon to bone healing encouraging the uh, healing of the rotator cuff tendon to the bone. Various techniques of rotator cuff tear have been described. The open, which is not recommended nowadays, the mini open and the arthroscopic, which are the more commonly used. There are four objectives stated by NEAR for rotator cuff repair. At first, closure of the cuff defect, eliminating the impingement, preserving the origin of the deltoid muscle, and preventing adhesions through the physiotherapy program later on. The mini open repair, uh, the incision is midway between uh, along in the line with the center of the acromion, less than five centimeters to avoid injuries in the uh, axillary nerve. It is through a deltoid splitting approach. First, we identify the bursa, then the bursa is excised, then we uh, do a tear evaluation. We roughen the footprint for better healing, then freshening the tear, and then a transosseous or suture anchor repair. The other techniques could be a traditional uh, single row repair or a double row repair. A variant of the uh, single row is the Mason Allen uh, single row uh, rotator cuff repair, which has a rip stop uh, together with a mattress suture to uh, allow a better um, fixation of the rotator cuff tendon on the greater tuberosity. And then the other modality is a double row rotator cuff repair. Another modality of the double row rotator cuff repair is the suture bridge. This is an algorithm uh, on the uh, rotator cuff repairs. The partial tear, we shall go for a single row. For the small tears, less than one centimeter, a single row as well. A medium between one to three centimeter, a single or a double row can work well. The large tears, less than five centimeters, a double row, a massive tears, double row or triple row. The treatment options for a failed rotator cuff repair is to do an arthroscopic versus an open repair. We can do a tissue augmentation through a superior capsular repair or patch reinforcement using balloon spacers, a tendon transfer surgery, a reverse shoulder arthroplasty, and finally the arthrodesis. This algorithm can help in um, taking decision. This is uh, if we have a rotator cuff tear identified by MRI and the tear is present. If it is a partial thickness tear, then no surgical treatment for three months conservative. If improvement, then no surgery. If no improvement, then we go for a diagnostic arthroscopy, deprivement and repair together with acromioblasty. If it is a full thickness tear, and it is a repairable tear, we will go for a diagnostic arthroscopy and a repair together with or without an acromioplasty and then rehabilitation. If it is an irreparable rotator cuff tear, we will go for a deprivement and bicep stenotomy and we consider a joint replacement. If uh, on the MRI the tear is not present, then it is an impingement syndrome and we go for a physiotherapy. Um, our, uh, the take-home message is that we should identify the anatomy, we should identify the tear, we should consider the rotator cuff biomechanics, we should uh, re 
choose uh, the repair type and we need to switch uh, the scope between the ports on rotator cuff repair. We shall do a bersectomy for a better uh, vision. We shall assess the rotator cuff from both surfaces, the articular and the bursal. Depridement of the footprint of the rotator cuff tear. We should do a proper release for better mobilization of the tear and don't repair the rotator cuff in abduction. Thank you.